that that someday when I'm ready to sell my genetics, I'll have a platform. I know all these fucking fabulous breeders all over the world, country now. And so um, I was like, okay, well, regenerative's a good platform. No one's doing a regenerative seed bank and uh, talking about biointelligent seeds. And I, I believe that it's a real thing. Um, I just heard a podcast that kind of was really gave me some science behind it. Sorry, I get a little shy and my voice goes away. Um, so the idea of biointelligent seeds, right? That the, the seed that has biology on it is is going to actually do better in a regenerative scene, right? We were talking about it yesterday with with uh, KNF and using IMO4 and IMO5 to introduce the biology and get it accustomed to. It's the same concept. And so in this this podcast I was talking about, they were actually talking about root hairs farming microbes, endophytes, positive endophytes, where they actually consume them for energy, but they hold back enough and farm them just like we do cattle. And then they'll pull off what they need for consumption and, and, get, and feed, and it's, it's fucking fascinating. Like our learning is going so deep. So that was the, con the original concept of this. And then I started talking to Bam um, of Stock and Bean Seeds, used to be Coastal Genetics. And he goes, bro, you know about the Seed Savers Exchange? And I was like, oh, yeah, fuck yeah, for vegetables, right? And it was like, bing, Dude, because this needs to be about the community. This is not just about, you know, the, the goal was for me to sell my seeds. And so anyways, I'm thinking about Phylos, and I go, okay, every 15% of all the seeds can go back to a fund, a seed preservation fund. And then we can also take a membership like the Seed Savers Exchange does where people pay, pay a bit monthly or quarterly, and they can be a part, and then... Every spring, we'll get all the breeders together, um, get on a big face chat or whatever, and uh, say, hey, what do we want to preserve? What strains? You know, Bob has a lot of NL, NL stuff or this and that, and then we, we preserve them. We send the money out to the, to the breeder to make the seed, take them back to the seed bank, save 10% for preservation there, and then redistribute to the membership equally. So, you know, the, a member could get every quarter, you know, thousands of seeds because we're going to fucking throw it down. And the idea is that they're going to take them and do their thing, pass them out. So, right. So we got Northern Lights everywhere. You know, fuck you, Philos. Try it. We got the seeds, you know. So that's, that's the basic concept. And so this was kind of a launch for that. I have a website up. I'm doing interviews on my YouTube channel with all the breeders, regenerative cannabis uh, on YouTube. And, uh, we're really going to try and push this thing and like try to really help 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 us help ourselves out. So, we really appreciate your guys' support. Um, and then tomorrow at noon we're doing a seed swap. You know, open all, bring your seeds, vegetable seeds, cannabis seeds. Like, it's been a really powerful event. I, I keep looking at you, Rio, because like you were the inspiration for it when we did this first conference and you came in with those light quibit seeds. I think I was at the mic and I was like, oh shit, why didn't we do this? Why didn't we just? This is what we need to be doing. And so. That's where the seed uh, swap idea became, you know, a thing. And, um, well, yeah, we're Josh and Kelly. Here's Josh. I just want to introduce Josh and Kelly, Dragonfly Earth Medicine. You all know them. Um, I kind of call you guys the mom and pop of regenerative farming. And uh, love you guys so much. So, so grateful uh, that you guys are here. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Joshua, Layton, everyone that put this together. Uh, give thanks for the seed exchange. Super important. You know, we just, we're not here to, you know, patent anything. We're here to, like, create new things and, and just get excited about the future, and that's what's up. You know, we just got to keep moving. This is, there's enough, you know, spirals downwards at this moment. So, um, is the, uh, the deaf family in here? Is the, uh, Jared or anything around? Anyway, if they come in, we'll uh, introduce them. Okay. So welcome everyone to our talk this evening, uh, this afternoon, one o'clock, two o'clock, whatever it is. We're really um, appreciative of being here. It's really beautiful. It's like the Garden of Eden for Earth in so many ways. And there's so many amazing family members here and, and farmers and family that we know and and we feel really um, blessed to be around them and and the pure certified group that, and, and the farmers that have everyone has been together and doing this motion of bringing regenerative farming to a lifestyle and bringing regenerative farming um, into the way that we eat the way that we think the way that we communicate with our family um, we have uh, a huge appreciation and a lot of respect for everyone that's in the 
area tonight and everyone who can't be here. And I just wanted to follow that up with, um, we're in the heart of cannabis country. I see a lot of faces here that have been with cannabis their whole adult life and maybe even before they were turning adults. This is an incredible focal point in the world. So much of the cannabis industry has spawned from this region, incredible roots to cannabis and beautiful landscape and amazing communities that have all thrived off of this medicine because you all are the medicine makers and have really taken this on in a way that's a lifestyle. And then the lifestyles led to a culture and that culture is spread all over the world. And I just wanna bow my head and my heart to all of you Northern Cali growers who have spread your seed all over the globe, who have hung in it through the hard times, especially these regulatory times, very difficult. Deep, deep, deep gratitude to all of you all in this land that holds beautiful cannabis. Today we're gonna to talk about um, how to get closer to a closed loop farm and how you can um, go beyond being an organic farmer and become a regenerative farmer. Um, we, we're going to a lot of farms and, and getting a lot of you know, comments and a lot of things from people and lists of what people are using and it's not just that your your inputs are organic it's or or omri listed you know it's it's about having things come from your land and being you know regenerative and so these practices that we're talking a lot about allow you to go beyond the product and connect with the land and come into um, in a way your full potential along with your land we feel that the habitats are declining in a really fast way right now. We know that there's a lot of extreme weather and there's a lot of species decline, but we really believe that there's also species creation happening. And we believe that it's now is more than ever we should have, you know, be creating habitat and wild zones to repopulate our lands. Um, we have had extinctions on the planet before, you know, with, with volcanoes and, and major eruptions and the, the world repopulated itself. So we can know in our hearts that, you know, we do the right thing and we bring our best foot forward. We can create um, a habitat that's going to save our life. And we can go beyond food um, that we get at the store and we can learn about heirloom foods and why they're important. And colorful foods and the flavanols and everything that we get from colorful foods and you know grow as many foods and open pollinate our our mindscape and our food we're going to talk about food security and medicine security in this talk um, this is a cannabis event but we also believe it's a food event because food is medicine but also medicine can be food so we're gonna And because uh, medicine and what we're growing not only has incredible nutritive values, fiber values, um, uh, values within our community, uh, values in equity, um, values within the mindscape. Cannabis is, it, it covers all of those things. Every single bit of flower that you all create out in the world is going to be smoked or ingested by someone, you're, you could affect their whole entire life. I don't know about you guys, but my first hit of weed put me right here in front of you right now when I was 14 years old. It changed my life, and I know a lot of you all are really feeling that way. And, you know, it, it, there's five Vedic herbs that goes back, you know, to 5,000 years and then beyond that, you know, back to the Upanishads who created us into being. Cannabis is listed over and over and over. Cannabis, I would dare to say, has created us. 
So we have an incredible responsibility to create it in a respectful way that is in symbiosis with Mother Nature. Um, so that's really important. Uh, so we're going to start off with soil building and, you know, how to, now is the time, it's winter, it's the, the rains are here, now is the time to sink the water into the earth. We know that a lot of the peat and cocoa and those kind of store-bought mediums are often not able to hold biology. They're not able to hold nutrients. They dry out a lot faster. So we're talking about how can we bring in more carbon and more um, life into our soil. So um, what we're we're, what we're doing and Green Source Gardens and all the other amazing families, Rio, I mean, there, I, I'm, I could go on and on, so that's why I have enough respect for everyone in here who's doing it. But um, So we're just stacking up wood and stacking up the, the hay and everything during the winter, because uh, you saw the pictures of the snow. We get a lot of snow in the winter, but if you don't get the snow, you still get a lot of water. And now is the time to plant your, your, your field with mushrooms. And, and plant your field with spawn and get everything growing because the life is here now. In the summer, it's really hard to catch up to it. Winter is a time for fungal, fungal growth, especially in your, this region, in this area. We're going to really stick to this region and talk about northern Cali specifically with cover crops, with perennials. Um, you know, right now in all of these rains, it just wants wood, like wood chips, anything that you can pull out from your property. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, a lot of people worry about, oh, is it fur? Is it, you know, it, it might have some acidity. If it's going to be, uh, you know, go all the way through, off all the way through a winter season with a lot of rains and even a lot of snow you all got this year, it's going to deacidify after it's off of the plant, off of the tree. So you can use all different types of wood chips and lots of fungal activity right now. So this is the time, and, and we can even wait, um, you know, probably until this full moon to do some cover cropping. Um, but now is the time, hugeling pull out as much fungal activity as you possibly can. And then you can look at it within three weeks and you can really see, you know, how much has been decomposed. Kingstropharia, oyster mushrooms, um, what do you have in the woods that's going to, you know, add any type of fungal activity to that? Um, I really recommend having um, a bed or something that looks like a sandbox on your property where you're filling a whole lot of material into there as well as your compost and then you inoculate it with Kringstropharia and then that could be enough to help inoculate all of your, your farms all around you and all of your friends. So sharing Kingstropharia is a wonderful closed loop because then that Kingstropharia and that mycelia becomes biologically intelligent to your region, your area, as well as the people who are also having the same growing practices as you are. And if you look at this picture, what we're encouraging people to do is use your beds as your compost pile. We do have compost piles because we have to gather, you know, materials here and there, but the IMOs are in the earth and the IMOs should be collected and what was said here was beautiful and there's amazing ways to inoculate indigenous microorganisms but if you can bring those seeds to your land and and create a habitat for them to grow then they're going to they're going to grow infinite and exponentially in your soil so we're preparing our beds digging out big uh, divots in between our aisles and packing the aisles with everything that we can. And you can overdo it with carbon, especially in a dry environment. So it's, it's not just throwing a bunch of wood chips down and uh, a bunch of hay. You have to be mindful of, of it being too dry and not enough biology in there. So that's where using some kind of compost or manure or some type of green, um, alf some kind of a good alfalfa, everything's organic that you're thinking of, of course because hay can be expensive organic sometimes, but if you utilize it properly, um, it can go really far and become an amazing um, jumping point. So if you mix the hay with the, the wood chips, then mycelium has a way of jumping from the hay to the wood chips. So when you first get spawn or bag spawn from someone, you can pull the bag spawn apart, put it in wet cardboard, 
get the, the mycelium running, you know, going through the cardboard, then it's active and it's activating. And then that cardboard you can stick, you know, say there's three, you know, seeds in each aisle right there. And then it just spreads out through. And it's a, it's a really beautiful thing. So your beds are the compost. You're thinking about layering and getting as much on there because that breakdown is going to save your water and, and do everything for you. Explain to people what they're seeing here, like how deep or how much are the aisles? Okay, well, this um, bed started out as a hard dirt rock floor. Um, you know, we excavated it. We've been excavating our property because we were really inspired with world agriculture, Asia and Guatemala and different things that we saw. And it really does sink the, the organism. So we did excavate that. And when we did, we got a really hard surface with rocks and hard dirt. So we really just had to build up. We had to give um, our uh, soil a chance to go up on it. So what we did is we piled different kinds of manure. We had goats in the area, horses and cows, and a little bit of llama at the time that came from neighbors. Um, and so we just, like I said, we dug it down probably two feet. That's probably close to two feet thick right there. So when you walk on it, it's super padded. And I have to say, we've built soil in different ways like we'll show you some other examples but this is a, a hay way of building soil you can build soil with with green manure and and grow corn or or some kind of a nitrogen loving plant like squash or something and you can transform soil with a green ma manure this we have the most amazing soil on our property from just stacking up hay for our potatoes initially and then just getting probably this much humus in like two years on a hard rock soil is there something else you want to say no i think you made it pretty clear and then the worms and <coughs> i just i wanted to explain that you can also utilize wood chip and manure compost piles in the winter right now to heat your greenhouses and Jean Pan Payne from France and from in, um, Europe has a lot of really amazing stuff on this because hay and manure tend to get really hot kind of fast and, and go away after a couple weeks. And maybe you lose a lot of your nutrients in that hot compost. We're less into hot compost because we don't want to lose anything. We want to cold compost things. Um, but this is an example of putting some kind of a maybe copper tubing or something in a, in a circle as you're putting in manure and hay and even mushrooms on the end and then surrounding it with hay and, and plumbing out the the um, the plumbing into the beds of your greenhouse so you can be building a huge amount of soil over the winter and heat your greenhouse all winter and maybe you just grow kale in the winter in your greenhouse you don't have to grow wheat all year I mean you should if you have to because a lot of people in California like have to make bills and it sucks here right now but um, also, you can do the same thing, same idea with, you know, really low pro and just dig a, uh, a big aisle inside of your greenhouse about two feet deep and make a hot compost right in the aisle. And it'll heat up and you can continuously add it. And it's amazing how warm it can get in there from the ambient light and just creating an easy compost right in your garden. We do that to start our seeds um, a little bit earlier, like uh, say for, you know, all of our peppers and our tomatoes, they take a long time to grow. So we put them in our greenhouse with a hot compost aisle and we get, you know, an extra couple of weeks on the growth every year with that. So this is a, a just a straight ganja and um, and hay compost pile, and it's up against uh, the earth. So the earth is like this and down, and we made that, you know, we kind of do a big harvest of our whole land and then we'll take a lot of our stocks and the things that we're deleafing and might, maybe we do some deleafing in the field and there's a hundred ways you can use your leaves, but sometimes you get into an abundance aspect, you know, so you just, we threw it all in this kind of like a bank, like a sink and we left it for a year, you know, over a year and this is what I use to do my living clones with, my living soil clones if I'm going to do any, if I got something sweet out of the, the pheno hunts or the chemovar hunts that we did this year, then maybe I want to clone a couple of those for 
breeding purposes and and it goes against all you know teachings because everyone not everyone but in nurseries often it's sterile and there's uh, fungicides and different dips used and different sprays because they have to keep the life out but if you have if in the soil there's already there's infiltration of life trying to come in and those organisms are so strong to keep them away that that life and that type of quality comes out in the clone so you can use this in trays by putting a half an inch and mixing this not just straight compost mixing it half with a, a native dirt or something from your soil that's not very rich because you don't necessarily need like a full rich situation so it's half wet half dry or more more inert and you put it together and then you put a half inch thing at the bottom of the tray and then mound with your hands just get the the, the dirt and make it with your hands and uh, put your clones in there and, and it goes crazy it's beautiful Um, so this picture here is that, you know, just beds, building beds, it's the importance of beds during the winter time. Everything that we were just talking about, layering, cold compost. We do a lot of work already um, in applications and, and tons of paperwork with county officials and everything right now. So I know that all of you all are probably feeling that pinch of that you can't really spend as much time on the farm as you want to be spending. Um, you know, time is limited. I've been hearing that across from everybody. I'd really just want to be on the farm and now I'm having to turn into a business person. Uh, so we can really help you by just saying, mound your beds. It makes it so you don't have to be out in your, your gardens that often. You can really just be out there and know that cold composting is a wonderful way to build soil. Uh, this is a hot compost pile. Sometimes during the winter time, uh, we're able to get some manure just right from our neighbor. So we do a hot compost um, because it just gets hot. We put it in a long row. And this is what we might start our seedlings with. So we start our seeds and then our seedlings go into another greenhouse to sort of grow out for our whole property. And that whole row would be just, you know, what are we working with for our spring planting? Microorganisms. Layer beds, this was just a plot of land. You just layer hay. Um, this was a brand new uh, hugel culture bed. Everybody knows what hugel culture is now at this point. You know, oh, do I worry if fir is in there? Am I worried if it's pine or other acidic trees? No, you don't. Um, we're going to show you. This is just the, the first year uh, of growth off of what you just saw of using everything from our native land. And I think that that grew over a 1,000 pounds of winter squash. And it just took, in the first year, and it only took a day to build. It was easy, and especially when you have cold compost piles all over your property because they're going to be in different stages. So some of them are like, oh, okay, I could put this in the bottom of the Hugo culture. It's brand new. Oh, I could put this in the middle. And then you've got ones that are like a couple of years old, especially with your nice cannabis or whatever type of biomass that you have, and that could be your top layer where you plant your seeds direct. Just wanted to say that rocks are a beautiful thing. Um, a lot of people are tossing rocks out of your soil because you you know there's the rocks, but uh, they hold water. Um, and mulching with hay is what a lot of people do, but there is rock mulching. And there's a whole book called Stone Mulching by Rodale from the 40s, and it's really cool. You should get it. Stone mulching, and we're stoners, you know. So. Um, but, you know, how often do you pull up a rock and see all kinds of worms and wetness in there? So if we've built this amazing, you know, bed in this mound, we want it to stay damp and stay wet because we don't want to lose our organisms. We don't want, that's why we don't like pots, because pots dry out so fast. So organisms are living and dying, you know, with dryness. But the, you, and maybe the rocks get a little hot, possibly, if the plants are not big and the sun's directly on it. So maybe you put a layer of vegetation over the rocks. 
and then you can still water through the rocks. Um, another thing you can do is use log culture for mushrooms. So in log spawn is where you get inoculated pegs. You get a tree that's alive, some kind of alder, some kind of fast growing water tree, and you cut it um, alive and green so it's not dead and it doesn't already have organisms in it. You want it clean of organisms so that when you put your plug in there, that organism is what goes through and eats up the, the log. But anyway, once you build your mounds, you can pack and, and, and kind of tuck the mounds in with log spawn logs. So you could grow reishi, lion's mane, maitake out of a log as, as, as a mulch on top of your bed. And that's really sweet too. So because then that's another thing is that when you add more mycology and you have more fungi in your soil, they breathe CO2. They, they exhale CO2 and breathe in oxygen like human beings. That's why mushroom medicine is so powerful for us because they're so much like us. And when they are exchanging air with cannabis plants, then there's a symbiotic environment happening there. And also it's, you know, it's with exudates and with the exchange of information, it's really potent to grow medicinal mushrooms underneath, you know, medicinal cannabis. And, you know, Steve from Green Life Productions is, is doing it inside as well, you know, so it doesn't have to be just an outside thing. You can pack it in indoor beds as well, living soils. And so, you know, just uh, a lot of soils that get tested are low in fungi or low in organic matter. So we're bringing the organic matter in and we're bringing in fungi. And the fungi in, in soil tests are not just, you know, garden giants. That's like a, a larger family of mushrooms. We're talking more like yeast strands and stuff, but the, the fungi also is, is important and it filters the water and filters the earth. We want our land to be a positive impact to the earth. We want to be able to create clean waterways because we don't want we want we don't want dead zones and that's the whole entire purpose of this teaching. Um, also, in this region, uh, in California, you all get super hot and dry. Um, so you can even do stone mulching on top of your mulch layer to really pack it in and add more microbiology and more of a sink um, for humidity. So I, I really love going to farms that have these beautiful slabs of rocks all over, you know, their gardens. It's, it's really quite beautiful to, to utilize the rocks that you have. And on, and on that with orchards, one of the best ways to take care of orchard trees is to sheet mulch underneath the tree with cardboard and then cover that with mulch because you want to kill or, or you want to smother all life underneath the tree like any grasses because the, the, the trees have shallow roots. And then around the drip line of the tree, you put a ring of manure. And a lot of fruit, in British Columbia, a lot of the fruit trees are dying. And that's a lame, that's terrible, you know, because fruit trees are really important. And spraying a bunch of stuff on your trees and a bunch of things is like, it's, it's a lot. This totally transforms trees, 100%. Complete smothering of all vegetation underneath, manure on the drip line, because then the drip line, the water goes in through the manure and feeds the ends of the roots. Yes, that works for cannabis too. Oh, okay. So um, we're just going to bring you right through. We, we all have seen, you know, Hugo cultures. Everybody, you know, knows about it. But we're just going to bring you through one so we can get like a step, step by step. We've got a lot of time up here today. We want to have lots of questions and answers. Also, you know, one thing we didn't say, if you all have a, like a burning question, like let's, let's like talk about it. We're all here to learn. Like, we're up here right now, and you all are there, but could easily swap. You know, the knowledge that's in this room is so vast, so we're all here to uh, learn from each other. So um, this is a first-time bed in our area and zone. Josh had said, you know, we don't have, but this is how much topsoil that we have. Um, we just are on one big slab of, of rock. So 13 years on our farm, every single bed that we have has been built above the ground. And now we have, you know, four and a half, five feet 
deep beds almost in all of our greenhouses. And this is the way that you start with the first one. So this is our friend. He's our neighbor. He came up with this little excavator. We don't bring on excavators ever onto our property. Everything is done by hand. It's just easier for us that way. But for this beginning stages of building an initial terrace, it's super helpful because it actually would take us, you know, maybe a month to do what he can do just in a few hours. So he's taking that very top layer of what we call topsoil, putting it all to the side, because we're going to be using that later. Um, and this is for building a greenhouse. So we're moving on. Uh, all of the, the wood that you saw in the back of the green of the truck has all been lied right on top of this intense rock layer, just mineral rich, a little bit of silt. Um, these are all cedar planks that were harvested from our property. We had two beautiful cedars go down, uh, and we really wanted to honor them and make them into greenhouses. Um, all the greenhouses on our property are made by us and what we have on our own land. We're burning the bottom of them because then it creates a creosote layer. So that creosote layer is like a protection, uh, like an, a, an antibiotic, an antifungal layer around the bottom so that it doesn't break down so quickly. Um, and we have a lot of rocks, so we don't really have to put cement or anything in it in the holes. Um, so this right here is just what you had seen earlier is just, it's all grass and hay. It's a hot compost layer that was down at the lower greenhouse and it's layered in there. It's manure and just straight hay. And also what's happening is we're, we've, we've taken all the branches. We don't burn on our property anymore. We don't burn. Everyone's slashing and burning. Is the All you're doing is stealing soil for your future. And fire smarting is a thing. And I can't tell people not to fire smart, but I can say that get your branches on the earth and leave them. If a branch is angled or bowed like most branches are, that's not going to break down as fast. And it might get dry and, and cracky and burn easy. But if you cut it into smaller chunks to where it's touching the earth, it's going to get wet and start breaking down. And, uh, and it will start growing grasses and, and it'll actually change the environment underneath. And sometimes grasses turn dry and then they burn. But um, just lopping and dropping your trees is super important. But then again, you sometimes you get abundance. So we use the trees. We also use dimensional lumber because I'm building and doing different things with greenhouses. So I have cutoffs and different things. So I'll throw the cutoffs in there too and layer it all in there. And then the, um, the sod layer, the sod top layer, we turn that upside down and put it on the, on the sticks. And that's kind of like smothering the grass to not want to just grow up. And grass didn't grow up, so that was totally sweet and worked awesome. And then on top of it, then the, the manure comes in, which is a little bit more green and fresh. Because you don't really, like I said, want a carbon bed. You need a carbon-nitrogen bed. The carbon-nitrogen ratio is what creates the perfect fusion for the breakdown. Don't want too much green, because then your roots are going to die. So this is what we've done. And then we can add you know, strafaria and different things to that bed as we're, as we're building it. And this is just a natural IMO just from the forest. So now we're thinking, oh, okay, well, we've got our beds done. Now let's seed them with microorganisms. So the IMOs that we're gathering is just the IMOs that are already in the forest that are already existing. What's, what's already pre-happening? What kind of biological intelligence of the mycelial layer do we already have in our zone and region that's breaking down just maybe 50 yards away? So that's really important. We take like a whole day of seeding those beds. Like that's a really important part of this. And we have, Mar oh, go ahead, question. The question is how to bring something from nature and get it to grow in your garden. For specifically, so, so for the strafaria, um, you're going to get spawn from some, I have some, and I, anyway. But yeah, you, cardboard. 
cardboard is a, is the first step. It's it's usually sterile and in the way that it's created, and it has the corrugated sort of air in between it and stuff. So you know, a, a couple layers of that corrugated, then you can get the mycelium running. But then putting that in hay or some kind of a clean hay, which is filled with water and kind of covered. You know, you need a, a moist environment for it to grow. So if it's too dry out or too hot or you got your spawn in the middle of the summer and you're trying to grow, it's going to be hard. But if you got your spawn like recently and, and you're doing it now throughout the winter, and I would also um, say Mycophyte Solutions is a new company starting out of Eugene, and they are going to be providing bulk spawn initially for our peer certified farms, but then f and for more people, and they're creating bulk spawn to inoculate fields. And so that's going to be a really exciting moment, Mycophyte Solutions. So anyway we are also getting um, native soils from our property and now we're to a point of just layering some of this is hay some of this is soil and then we and then when we get to a certain point we cap it off with some dirt some local dirt that is pretty fertile so i guess i got to tell you guys the story about this and i know that so many people have the same story um some bro came to our house and brought us like thousand plants, clones. We don't even do clones. And he didn't like come back and he said he was going to come back. And then I saw these clones in the tray and I was like, fuck, I need to kill those clones. They've got like bugs and I don't even know what's going on. And I like scoped them and I saw a couple different bugs. And then the plants sat in the trays in the sun for a day. And then my mothering instinct was like, shit. I gotta water these, and it's just like a puppy comes in off the street, you feed it once, you're totally fucked. So I watered them once, and then I started to treat them, and then, oh shit, we don't have anywhere to put these, and then let's build a greenhouse, because now here's these plants, and so really that's the story. Um, so this was our first uh, experience with clones. They were, uh, we made them super healthy, so now this year we have a new greenhouse um, because of these clones, and this is the first year, so roll out. Oh, right, so um, in order for us to, to take care of um, them, we just gave them incredible nutrition, put them in a smaller greenhouse that became like a hot house, and we did heat treatments on them because these plants had thrips, they had um, russet mites. I had actually never even seen russets in, in Canada before. Um, they had broad mites, they had aphids, they had like all of them, and it was funny because the dude bro was like, they're clean. Um, so, which a lot of people will tell you. Um, so then we put them in a greenhouse, 120 degrees, up to 122. This is a wonderful, wonderful way to deal with pathogens in a greenhouse situation or indoors. Heat treatment is fantastic. It really doesn't bother the macrobes or your ladybugs. The wasps go crazy, you know. So 120 to 122 for three solid hours. Make sure that the roots are damp. And a higher humidity is great. Make sure that you're in there. You're checking it out continuously. And um, we suggest that you do that every three days for three times. And we were able to completely clean up these clones and plant them the next day. And you can even see that, you know, usually you build a greenhouse before you plant the plants, but we just skipped that. Um, so we're trying to make that happen. So these were out in the sunshine for a while. And then as the rain started, we were thinking, oh, geez, we need to light depth these because they're clones that were indoor clones, which we never do, you know, so there's a lot of nevers this year. And um, finally got a greenhouse plastic up. We were able to do another heat treatment once the greenhouse plastic was up. And this, again, was the first year garden with hugeling. You all saw the process, and we had an unbelievable, gorgeous, beautiful harvest out of a first-year accidental hugoculture greenhouse. 
And didn't use really any teas other than I made hash in the middle of the summer and used all the hash water on the on the plants. So I'm just terp water in the plants feels so good and it tastes good because I'm drinking it too. You know what I mean? It's just everything's going in and it's just growing. Um, but it's just amazing health and it's just really quickly, it's just really qu uh, amazing to put together such a crazy bed of just wild raw materials just like ah, out of the forest and build burning sticks and all of a sudden we these plants just fuse into it and I think for so long we were taught about super soils and like oh well this soil's been like supered you know it's been cooked it's down it's got all this stuff in it and now it's ready to grow a plant and for so long, it was like, dude, we got to go through all this before we have to grow a plant. That's crazy. And then you realize that, wow, the, the breakdown is the life. That's the living soil. The living soil isn't living if it's been created. It's creating. That's the living part. So it's just really beautiful to see even a clone or something that was, you know, having a hard time just, just grip into it. You know, and really have the incredible terpene profile that came out of the plants. Yeah. Quick question. Leaf surface, and that's a good question. We've um, tried to use uh, digital temper uh, temperature guns, and a lot of times when it gets like crazy hot, like it doesn't work. And I know 120 is like almost easy to do down here, and I know because it's like already 110, but. Um, but even up to 130 in, in those environments, it's amazing. Like, I'll be sitting in the greenhouse just drenched in water, but I feel like I got to be in there a little bit because I want to know the plants are praying. They, they, they really go and pray, and it's amazing. And I have seen the, the too much part, and they kind of, like, fold over a little bit at the top. And at that point, you have to be really careful and open it up and not get too much wind in there or no direct sun because they kind of have to bounce back from the heat treatment and kind of re-solidify. But anyway, beautiful plants, super stoked, give thanks, nature wins again, and um, go to the next one. Mendo breath. <laughs> Mendo breath, trying to make it work up in a snowy environment. It was snowing when we, when we harvested that, you know, and that wasn't a goal. And then Ganja Gill was talking to Ganja Gill, and I was like, dude, I got these plants, you know. And, and he's like, you should wash them just fresh right out of the greenhouse. I'm like, dude, that's a sweet idea. So I just took the plants, just put them right in the ice water. It's snowing all around me. I'm washing up fresh plants. I'm just getting out this amazing, this amazing resin, and I'm just like, this is trippy it's cool it's different and amazing flavor came and the consistency of the hash when it dried out was really quite different than the others than the other uh, dried out versions um, so we're just going to show a couple more versions of what we've done like if we have a bed that we feel like we got to get into a little bit more we'll just dig a channel out of out of the center of it and maybe dig it down like two or three feet and just pack it with leaves pack it with uh, all the stuff that we've talked about, compost, getting compost seeds, forest seeds, wetland seeds, high alpine seeds, meaning dirt, you know, and packing it in there and creating a, a, a trench and then covering the trench with dirt and then the uh, roots just go into that trench all summer. So you actually don't see the trench in the middle of the summer because plants are growing over it. Um, also, you're seeing a picture of leaves. Now is the time. Leaves are incredible. Deciduous tree leaves and leaf mold is unbelievable. And the reason why I'm saying that is because every single leaf that you see is a representation of the deep mining that that tree did to form a leaf. So its roots go as wide and as deep as it is high and wide, as the tree is high and wide, to gather up all of these minerals. So leaves are just incredibly important. Pile them up. Get them on those beds. 
it's wonderful. You're going to really notice incredible microbiology that sprouts over the winter. And then whatever you cover crop, we're going to get into a big discussion here on cover cropping and what's good here in this region and zone. And when you're cover cropping on top of, you know, your fall leaf beds, you really notice the difference right away. And you want to be cover cropping to start those endomycorrhiza and that fungi already in your soil. So when you put your cannabis in and you put your food and vegetable plants in, that it already has growing fungi on those roots. And that's another reason to cover crop. You know, we know all of the reasons of soil retention and we know, you know, erosion, we're losing so much of our topsoil. We know that, you know, green manure is wonderful. All of these reasons to cover crop Crop, but one of the main reasons to cover crop is you're creating fodder for the microorganisms that you created in your beds all summer long. If you're not growing something in your beds when your cannabis and your vegetables are not growing, your microorganisms are hungry. So put in some nice cover crop to help with that. Um, and uh, the the leaves are a representation of also the branches and the ends of the branches. So when you go to chip or if you go to, to use Hugo culture, uh, a term is called ramiel chipped wood, RCW, is um, bushes or small branches coming off the tree have 70 to 75 percent of all the nutrients and all of the trace minerals in that part of the tree. You start getting into the mother's stock of the tree and you just get you get a lot more carbon. But when you get out to the branches and you get out to the leaves, you get to where it's if you make chips out of a bunch of bushes or a bunch of small branches like the ramiel chipped wood, it's more of a nutrient than an actual uh, carbon source because there's enough cambium layer and enough uh, a juice going around there that it's decomposing itself. So that, that smaller bush, bush chip and, and leaf chip are extremely uh, nutritive to your soils and they create fungi darn near right away. So it's an incredible nutrient source. And um, you know, groundwater is a, and it's a, is a real issue and in the middle of the winter there's amazing amounts of water so there's a lot of issues in California right now with f with uh, um, making ponds and and gathering water so I really have to suggest you know getting to know your local um, parameters on that but knowing your groundwater and how to direct it and sink it to areas is really smart you could direct water away from somewhere and put it towards a wet you could make a bog habitat and have bog trees or whatever it is and it's just smart to think about here's another example of a hugel culture sometimes the dirt it makes sense to go into the ground so sometimes you go on top. If it's super clay and if you've dug a hole and you filled it up with water and the water just fills up and it doesn't go down, you don't want to be digging any trenches in that because you're just creating a pool. And then your roots are going to go anaerobic and you won't have a healthy plant. But if you have good drainage, it does kind of make sense to sink the wood into the, into the beds. And, you know, that can go down three to four feet pretty easy with an excavator. And then you have all this native soil on the side so you can feather in nutrients and native soils as you put it back together and so you're getting more towards your own terroir and you're more Appalachia. You can't have terroir in Appalachia with, you know, store-bought soil. So that, again, that's, we'll touch on that more later, but that's why this is important. So we're now we're building our, our farms. We're, we're trying to create spirals. We want labyrinths. And uh, we just want our farm to be interesting and we want it to be fun. We don't want it to be just work. It can't be boring and it has to have a lot going on because we want to feel good when we go out there. Go to the next one. So here's an, um, an idea of a living planter that you might be able to do with, uh, instead of using um, pots, maybe you just use hay. And in the hay, you can inoculate that hay with King Strafaria, and you could cover the top of it with log mulch, and you could have um, the underneath part have some rocks in it so it had, uh, you know, drainage. And uh, you could make that into a really long bed, or you could just do pods of it, but you would pretty much, all of that hay would totally disappear over the year. And you would just, you could just kind of fold it back on top and do a whole other thing of hay. And you just do hay every year. And we filled up our whole garden, like 100 bales of hay in our garden, and had to re-add hay by that fall. 
So Hay's insane, and it's really awesome, and you can create barriers on the edge of your beds even and just let it rot. Song called Let It Rock. We're talking about Let It Rot. Um, and, you know, and this is a beautiful reishi mushroom. Um, it comes out of a spawn bag, but, you know, the reishi is a really potent mushroom, and we really love polypores, and um, growing them with your, uh, with your uh, ganja makes a hell of a lot of sense. Um, so now we're going to start changing and going into uh, biodiversity and polyculture on your land. After you've built your soils and you have all these beds and, you, and you've, you've thought about your land, um, we're making a suggestion to everyone, including ourselves, because um, we really haven't done this yet, but we think w everyone should make a bio assay, an assay of all the plants on their land. It would be a personal challenge. Maybe you don't know all the plants, but you could just walk your land and with a notebook and just say, oh, there's my, there's plantain, there's weeds, there's the, you know, whatever tree it is or the bush and, and challenge yourself to write, write it down and find it out so we can all get to know the plants better. You know, we all know plants, but we can all know them a lot more. So, you know, getting to know seeds, we're, we're growing gardens and we always focus on the fruit of what we're growing, but the, one of the main purpose of gardens is to create seed, you know, and if you're cover cropping, you should let some of your cover crop go to seed or create a cover crop garden at your house with the cover crops that you like. Let them go to seed. It doesn't take a lot of plants to make shitloads of seeds. Um, so right now uh, in California, because, you know, it's, it's, it's cool, Right now, you all might have some hard frost. A lot of the cover crops that you all can plant right now definitely can go through quite a good frost. Some things that you might want to start right away, um, and I'm just going to list some stuff off. We're going to sort of have some, some juice in here, too. So winter rye, um, barley, sweet clover, oats, Oats are awesome. Radish. And daikon is really great. Any kind of like long radish that can break into the soil, something that's like hard. Um, hairy vetch is really great this time of year. Winter peas. And because, you know, I'm just noticing these really warm days, you all can start right in with your crimson clover, your field peas, your fava beans. And sweet clover, we've, I've just recently looked at, you know, all of the statistics and people are doing some really great research on cover crop and sweet clover is the kind that's really low to the ground and it's more of, a, more of an indigenous type clover, the way that it grows up with us and it really is turning out to be incredible more nutrient value than any of the other clovers. But again, diversity is awesome. So having a wide variety of clover is great. Clover is also a fantastic indicator as you all know for any kind of like fungi or you know any type of leaf eating mildew I really don't like to say DM or PM because there's so many different varietals of leaf mildew that can land on your plant depending on what area you are in or what type of a climate that you're in um, and it can be dealt with on lots of different ways. So I mentioned radish. Another favorite, I think that, you know, everybody in California should be cultivating and starting it really early is chickweed. Chickweed breaks down. It creates a beautiful mycelial mat. It is wonderful for water retention. Um, yeah, fantastic. Here's some uh, corn. Corn is really wonderful for Oh, that's sorghum. Oh, sorry, Sudanese sorghum. So Sudanese sorghum, that's one to, to get into our memory banks. Let's uh, share big 100-pound bags of it with our uh, family and, and our friends and, and the farms next to us. This retains, like, I don't even know, it can grow up to 50 different species of mycorrhiza on its roots. So it really is a wonderful nursery fodder food to bring into your gardens, and it's really easy to grow. And this is a really wonderful mow crop as well. So as you're planting your, your cover crops, looking at different mow crops, which means that you can plant it, and then it can become biomass for the entire season 
long. And, you know, I, I'm not meaning, you know, like bring in a lawnmower or anything like that. There's lots of different ways that you can take down, um, you know, your grasses. But wonderful mow crops that you can have in your aisles are the Sudanese sorghum, alfalfa, oats, clover, comfrey, nettles, and my favorite, the dandelion. So let's spread those dandelion seeds right now. They're the first ones to come up. And when those pollinators are really hungry, they're the ones that you'll see sometimes right now. I, I, I was seeing a little dandelion out there and it had four little pollinators on it. Like they're hungry right now. Um, so I guess I'm just gonna start moving into now your summer cover crops. Summer cover crops are really important because your summer cover crops, you want them to also be your pollinator crops. So, you know, you're cover cropping, but you want to grow them up because you want them to have good water retention, good soil retention. They're feeding your microbiology and also pollinators. So I think what we've come to in working with all of the farms that we work with sort of all over the globe and seeing the incredible pressure that we're having on pests and pathogens. The world is changing. You know, we're not always making the best decisions on what we're putting into our body or what we're putting into our water or our air. So the pathogens are becoming really intense. And I know that when I started this 30 years ago, this is the first time I put in my first cannabis crop, I never had pests. Like, I didn't even see a spider mite until many years, like, after that. And now all of us are becoming, like, you know, pest scientists. And we're learning more. I mean, I'm hearing more conversations about, like, yeah, dude, did you see, like, that, that arthropod and then the pirate bug? And, like, now we're, like, really getting good at it. And what we're noticing is those who are spraying their gardens are behind. Sprays, to my belief, do not work. And it doesn't matter what kind of sprays you're doing. Nutritive sprays foliar for vegetative time is really wonderful. But if you're spraying for IPM or IPFM, fungal management, you are behind. But the way that you get ahead is create massive pollinator gardens. I cannot even express how important pollinator gardens are right now in all of our gardens. Not only do they bring beauty and spice and terpene profiles, and they're going to also bring these massive predator bugs, and they will annihilate this horrible bong aphid that people are dealing with, you know, on all of the other pathogens that you all know. So summer cover crops to put in your garden that are going to be bringing nutrition from the air and the environment into the soil as well as feeding those pollinators. And pollinators need diversity. Some, pollinate, some pollen feeds predator mites. Some pollen feeds bees. Some pollen feeds the, the parasitic wasps. So let's have like all kinds of pollen, you know, like a potluck of, and I meant to do that potluck, of pollen um, for everybody. So let's, buckwheat is awesome. Sun hemp, fast growing, amazing, great flowers. Sunflowers, partridge pea, lupins, flax, fantastic. Flax is amazing. And remember, the bigger the flower, the larger the pollen, the bigger the pollinator. So having really small little teeny tiny flowers like the Queen Anne's lace um, is also just really important, which is the hemlock family, the cow parsnip, carrot, the wild carrot, alyssum, bishop's weed, and this is going to be videotaped, so if you can't get it all down, um, hairy vetch, the German chamomile, tiny little flowers that are really going to draw all of those, you know, great predator mites, quinoa and amaranth. And if you plant these 
in a, you know, around the outside of all of your gardens and your greenhouses and even around the outside of your house, you're creating a beautiful barrier of health and well-being. And they're always going to have to come through that to be able to enter your garden. And, you know, we had a, a one plant that all of a sudden was infected with um, aphids this year, just one on the edge of the, of the greenhouse. And wow, that's really interesting. And then I didn't think about it too much because it was just one plant. And then I had gone down there like three days later because we really take on our pollinators. And I counted 11 different species that all eat aphids. And within that week, they were all gone. So, you know, creating that beautiful cycle of, you know, regeneration you know, and what, what, what I had said before is that, you know, this plant is, is giving us, you know, a higher vibration, a different type of thought process. Well, when you couple that with regenerative farming, then we're getting incredible intelligence from the microbiology that we're working with. We are this microbiome, and there's billions of, of different intelligent types of being inside myself and inside of all of you. And if we're working in the soil and we're working with intelligent, beneficial microorganisms, then we become intelligent. Then we make the right choices. Then we're truly allying with Mother Nature. So I really believe that cannabis is going to catapult us and regenerative cannabis farmers are really going to be able to catapult the rest of the world. She a question, Shango? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I have a feeling that you guys are probably brainstorming what kinds of cool like insect motels would look like on the property. Can you share anything you've got to share? Yeah, we, we have a couple of uh, shots of some insect uh, hotels coming up and also the act of stacking rocks and having the wood piles around is it's a house too you know so the 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 mob gardening style that we're doing the the mound gardening and stuff and all that really um, allows the the insects to live in a wild habitat um, also there's fortress gardens you know which if if you live in a big ag area you might have a fortress garden all the way around your field and that's going to be more trees more bigger trees to stop air from coming in or maybe really tall hedges so and we and for hemp farming we really recommend that you know we really recommend in a larger hemp farm that there should be a big wild strip of trees around your field and potentially flower strips in between your hemp because it's not efficient if you're hemp is getting eaten so why not allow some of your in-between zones to be all flowers so we think that uh, the flowering bushes superfood bushes sometimes flower all year zinnias marigolds yeah they, they go all year um, and and I'll let you go on just that one sec the one thing about um, cover crops and the and the the mounding and, and the, the the mulching is sometimes cover crops make sense and sometimes mulching makes sense so if you have a super rich bed you might not not need a cover crop and you might just go with really heavy mulch and just let the mulch eat it so or maybe you just do the cover crop in the sever uh, in the middle of it and mulch on the outside there was a question back here so actually I could just move right into this so I, I have a whole list of perennial border plants that are the first blooming in the spring which I think is incredibly important because just like we were talking about creating fodder for your microorganisms right off the bat you need to create fodder for your parent or for your um, uh, pollinators that are coming through that's super important right at the very beginning and perennials for this zone and area you don't have to do anything they just keep coming up year after year and I really suggest that when you have those perennial gardens that you're really thinking about ooh, what's gonna bloom in February what's gonna bloom in March so I have a list that is this wonderful border for you know all of your perennials um, Fruit trees, first ones to bloom. 
Daphne, another one, first ones to bloom. Fruit trees are amazing. Let's get them in the ground. Crab apples all around your, your gardens. They grow so well. They grow fast. They make wonderful ferments. Um, Armoria, bleeding heart, chives, candy tuft, clematis, coral bells, phlox, daisy, and again, you're going to be able to listen to this if you can't get it all, veronica, ice plant, one of my favorite, the digitalis foxglove, grows so beautiful. Um, and then your bulbs. Now's the time. Let's, let's get in the ground. Let's start planting bulbs and be thinking about, wow, these big pollen are going to be grow, you know, bringing on uh, big wasps and, and honeybees into my zone and area right away because they're going to recognize my farm when they're flying over and going, yeah, buddy, this is a beautiful place for me to stop and, and colonize my whole family. Uh, so there's peony. Peony is a super early blooming. Bumblebees absolutely dig it. Milkweed. Let's bring back the, the, the butterflies. That one's not a perennial. It's a seed plant. And um, we have a lot of these seeds in our, in, our, in our cannabis seeds that we have today, too. Dianthus. And I think I already said Veronica. So yeah, those are really awesome for these zone and region. Yeah, you have a question. Yes, I think it does. Yes, I think that it really matters. But a lot of the plants that I just brought up here, which was I, gonna, which, which was, I was going to say, is that they're the early bloomers, and they're the ones that you all don't have to water. The ground is already wet. I know a lot, of water is precious in this zone and region. Very difficult to say, oh, yay, I want to have big perennial beds that take, you know, huge amounts of water. That's why I plant fruit trees. Their roots can go down low. Plant them in, in the fall, you know, when you know that they're going to be able to get, you know, their deep roots down. And then you're drawing all of these pollinators to your farm. If you have access to water, having an ongoing, you know, constant rotation of always having flowers of all different sizes and sorts to be able to keep all those pollinators around is absolutely what is going to keep your cannabis clean. I, I know it. I've seen it. There was a huge outbreak in Williams about three, two or three years ago with the aphid. The only farms that didn't even see them or have them were the ones that were either cut flower farms or they were really working on their perennial beds and, and their pollinator gardens. And, and, and these pests are really, you know, coming down on us. So let's plant perennials that come back year after year and they have long tap roots and they don't need a whole lot. Um, I also have some early blooming native California, a list of 10 that's absolutely imperative to have on your property at this time, you know, because they're going to be blooming and our pollinators are really needing our help. So that's the California lilac, the peri manzanita, Oregon grape. Let's give it up for Oregon grape. Wow, I mean, come on, that has multiple blooms. It feeds so many different pollinators. The red twig dogwood, the western red bud, blue elderberry, yarrow, love it. The naked or nude buckwheat, California wild rose, just mentioned. And then the globe gilia. Those are all must-haves in your zone and area. Those are really highly intelligent pollinators that are going to come to your farm and really um, want to have the nectar off of those flowers.
And also to add another dimension to what you're saying, you're, you're creating a, a different layers of canopy when you're planting small ground things underneath trees and bushes in between. And that's really where the nutrient cycling begins. And that's really the teachings of an edible forest. And, and using native species is also really key. She did talk about that. Native species are really crucial. And there's some really good nurseries around in Northern California, wherever you are in Michigan, wherever it is. Um, native species are really, really important. Let's all get at least 100 new plants that we've never had this year, and that's a lot. Daniel? That's the wild black cap raspberry. And there's canes coming up now in the beginning, so you could potentially. That's cool. I like that. Good, good advice. Anyone else have any ones that they love? What is it? Ceanophis. I like it. Ceanophis. Um, coffee berry. Calscape. Beautiful. And there's a, sorry? Blue eyed? Blue eyed grass. Say it again. Coyote mint. Beautiful. California poppy. Nice one. Question? Not bad. No, it's beautiful. Just pull it up. Yeah, personally, it likes to grow in, in areas that's like, um, it's a wonderful nutrition. It's great. So areas that are sort of disturbed and don't have a whole lot of nutrition, you'll see purslane. And purslane has like these great omega oils. So it's really wonderful to put into your ferments or have as a cover crop. Um, and also you can eat it and put it in your salads. So purslane is, is a really good one. And it's actually showing you that, whoa, okay, this, this soil wants to start coming alive again. It's an indicator that that soil is really interested in starting to come alive again. Fennel and mugwort. Mugwort's super crucial in natural farming. Used a lot. Motherwort, another good one. Huh? Verbena, that'd be a good terp. Little, uh, yep. because of the properties of the way that it grows and the growth hormones that are in it and the fact that it, it rarely ever gets any kind of bug or any kind of disease and it's a, a survivor plant growing out of you know, soils that are maybe not so d uh, damp and um, it's a prebiotic, so it's, yeah, yeah. Um, did you have another? I yeah, I could just really quickly. Um, another all summer blooming that don't require a lot of water is lavender, marjoram, Rosemary, Echinacea, the Black-Eyed Susans, um, Blanket Flower, and um, yeah, those ones. And low-lying grasses, they're really good too. And maybe 525,000 more that we didn't yeah. mention, um, which is a really good... Um, thing to bring us towards this, which is a really beautiful th uh, thing called a kinship map. And so this is a new con, it's not new, but it's, it's sort of newer. And um, Alan Capular is a really amazing molecular biologist in Corvallis, good friend of ours, good friends of the family. His kids um, are also very active in making seeds and they're also the ones that help us with our Willow Project and have helped guide us through our Willow Project at Oregon Country Fair. Um, this is a kinship map of by Priscilla Spears, who also lives in Corvallis. And what's 
what's amazing about this is because we're, we're giving out lists and we're talking about a lot of stuff. But what this is, this is a kinship map, not for mushrooms, but for the plant kingdom. And it starts at the bottom at the ancestral seed, the first seed that came out of the ocean, the more simple organisms. And then it shows how the, the, the families grow and they, they evolve and they become more complex organisms and they turn into the mangalids on the side and the magnolia trees and the, and the tulips, the tulip trees and all these. You can look at all of these families right here and I'm going to go to the next one which shows how many species are in each family and this is a way you can use this list to diversify your land. You can get into the monocots and find out all the plants are which are within these, and the monocots are the more s are the single the single leaf that comes up, the mono, the one leaf that comes up, and yeah, the grasses, the alums, and the asparagus, the bamboo, the bananas, the corn, the daffodils, the garlic, the ginger, the grasses, the lilies, the onions, the orchids, the rice, sugar cane. All of that is a monocot, and it comes and and yeah, it goes to, to give it there for a sec, and then it goes into the to the eudicots and the dicots, and then um, and then these traits end up going on the map. So you're you're gonna find monocots out here, and it doesn't mean that the monocots stopped, but the dicots and everything, the cannabis is over here in the Rosales uh, area, and. Um, so the, the eudicots is the two leaves, the two leaves that come up, like the ganja has the two leaves. Sometimes there's three, but it's not called a tricot, so maybe we should call it a tricot. Um, but this is just a, a beautiful map to go through and add these different things to your land. Do you have a representation of all these plants on your land? Some of it's environmental, but a lot of these kingdoms aren't really just about a certain bioregion. You know, there's, there's trees in there, there's shrubs in there, and um, this is a really a some, somewhat of a new thing It's not really talked about. Um, we have a, a YouTube channel that is Dragonfly Earth Medicine YouTube, and we have some, some, some of our panels and stuff on there, and we also have some of Alan Capular's talks on kinship gardening, and you can check it out. Amazing person, amazing greenhouse. Um, so, yeah, and that's going to help you diversify your land. And these are going to, you know, are, is a nice visual of, you know, the difference of what's happening inside the seeds. And we're, um, keep going. The broad leaves starting to come out. You can see how, and another really special thing about kinship gardening is if you have a garden that's a kinship map, so you're going to create that as a garden. So you're going to see plant evolution happening in front of you. You're going to you're going to know, you know, what came from what and you're going to start realizing that plant botany used to be broken down based off mostly characteristics like Linnaeus in the 1700s and there was a, you know a huge teaching of botany and the way that it was classified it was a lot of it was based off characteristics of leaves and and flower structure but the genomic revolution that we're seeing in cannabis has also been happening with food and probably since the 90s insane revelations have come in the plant world. And I would just love to challenge you all, including myself, to really get to know that a lot better. So um, now we just wanted to open it up to, to Q&A. And, and if there's anything that you all are thinking too, and this isn't just like Q&A, like you know, you're asking us a question, but if you felt like you had something to share in here, um, there's lots of, um, these are some pictures too of some of the native uh, plants that we were talking about so you can get a look at them, um, get to know them. But if there's any questions, yeah. So are you talking about like low-lying plants underneath your cannabis? So are you, food crops, that's awesome. Um, um, 
But basil does amazing because basil really likes to be shaded as well as any salad greens. Oh, okay, I'm going to repeat the question. So he was asking, what kind of plants do we like to grow underneath our cannabis plants that can be harvested and not really interfere too much with our cannabis during, during cultivation time? Because we're giving so many teas and great nutrients, why not put other things underneath our cannabis plants? Of course we want to do that. So salad greens are really wonderful as an ongoing right underneath the base of the plant. And then you can do, you know, more greens. Um, German base, uh, chamomile is really an awesome one to have on the edges. And as you get further out where there's going to be more sunshine, you can even put your tomatoes, um, uh, peppers. I love to put peppers on the base because they're really high. They love nutrients and they really love all of the teas that we give the cannabis plants. And we're able to get, you know, big, rich, beautiful uh, peppers um, at the end. But right underneath, too, fingerling potatoes, one of the best. I mean, you can grow uh, enough potatoes for you and all of your neighbors and your whole community underneath your cannabis plants, and you don't really even need to do anything. Just, just plant them there. And the reason why I say fingerling is because they don't go deep. They stay even more shallow than, you know, other traditional, more round, uh, bulkier potatoes. So that's been like, we've been able to pull, you know, a whole year harvest of fingerling potatoes from underneath our... our Ganja. Um, you want me to? Oh, yeah, rhubarb. Rhubarb is a great thing to have on your property. It's wonderful for uh, phosphorus. Um, you can continue to, to use it. It's great for a fermenter. Um, we love rhubarb. I love to eat it. I put it in a lot of different things. Yeah. Using, oh, so the question is what kind of trees, you know, uh, uh, what, what trees maybe don't you want to put into a Hugo culture? Uh-huh, so he says he has a property that's full of eucalyptus and acacia. Can you put that in your Hugo culture beds? Yes, definitely. You can, you can put it in the bottom of, of your beds, at the very bottom. Are you making wood chips to create layers with that eucalyptus? No. I, don't, I really think that there's a few trees that do have such high uh, terpene and resin content that they're actually inhibitors of growth. Eucalyptus is one, and it's, yeah, high tan, and it's black walnut is another one. Cedar is another one, but even cedar can deacidify, you know, after a whole, a whole year. So, yes, you can use them, but put them at the bottom so that the microorganisms are able to break it down by the time that the roots reach it. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. Great at the bottom of every Hugo culture bed. So the question was, is all of the bark um, from your firewood, we, we get heaps and heaps of it every year. And it just becomes, you know, always we save it for, oh, we're going to save that pile for our new Hugo bed. And we always say that we're done making new garden beds, but for some reason every year we make a, a new one. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the question is, are there any root crops that are wonderful companion plants with cannabis? All root crops, they all flower. One thing that, that I forgot to say is that also when we're putting in our cover crops and whether when we're planting, we also want to be thinking about seed production. Not only seed production for your next cover crop, but seed production for the small birds that come in to your garden. They see the seeds and those are also the same seeds that eat the caterpillars that people have problems with. So, so planting for seed production during the time when, when that hatching starts to happen is really important. Um, but, uh, you know, carrots are wonderful. They create a very tiny, small flower that feeds small mites uh, that are, are great predators. So, you know, I could go on and on. Beets are wonderful. Um, rutabaga. Uh, any of the turnips are fantastic. 
Yeah, and, and yakon. So Josh is going to talk about yakon. Really important. I think that there's going to be yakon here, crowns uh, that Dave from Sweetly for the Plant is bringing for a bunch of us. Here's some bees getting it done at the Heart Rock Mountain Farm. Give it up for Daniel and the family over there. Ganja is also a pollinator. <laughs> so um, we had a lot of plants up here. And we're going to talk about our teas, superfoods, berries, goji berries. Anyway, so here we go with the tea house. Um, I'm just going to talk really quickly about the way we do our teas. A lot of you know, maybe some of you don't, but we like, um, tea, we like building too. So uh, this is a design of a tea house. We built one over at Mike Frost's house, the Y Gardens up in Washington and made a Merkaba garden there and it's really beautiful. But the idea is that you have a teas up, you know, eight feet or something and then you're just above and so you can gravity feed you know, your, your whole garden. And you can look above your garden and see what's going on. And you can have wings going off on the side, which allows you to dry your biomass or maybe have tables out there or stumps and you can get biomass racks going and worm, worm farms and compost bins. And this is the yacone. So the yacone is the South American tuber. We talked about it last night. Some of you were here, some of you weren't. It's part of the lost food of the Incas. And we think that this is a, a really extremely important plant. It has a really watery tuber. It's it's very sugary and very watery. So at the end of the year, you can harvest the tuber. You can shred it and press it and get water out of it and boil that water down and, and make syrup. You can also drink the leaves and tea and it connects the gut and brain bacteria and it's, it's got a, a sugar source of inulin which is more of a prebiotic for your, your gut flora um, than, than the other sugars which are a little bit more hot and react in yourself too much. So um, we grow the yacone around in our gardens uh, all around the outsides and you can also, they, they, they bust up the ground and, and they're really beautiful. And there's more than one kind, and they're, they can be really colorful. And there's also the crystal yacone can get up to one kilogram in weight. And it looks like that when you slice it open. It's really beautiful. You can eat it, and it's a lot like, a, a, they, like an apple. It's kind of like they say it's an apple. Yeah, and this can easily be grated up and put into any of your ferments as the sugar source. Um, you know, we all have our different views. We can only be up here telling you what works on our farm. Um, I don't believe in bringing in sugar. I don't eat sugar. Um, I feel like it creates incredible yeast issues. Um, I believe that the sugar industry right now is at an all-time high of corruption and has really ruining our landscape and ruining our waterways. Um, also, when you see on your packaging, the word just says sugar, it's not cane sugar. It's beet sugar, which is a GMO product, and when you test that, it has glyphosate in it. So if you're adding regular domino sugar to your ferments, or domino is the cane sugar, but other sugars, you're probably most likely getting a beet sugar. Please be careful. Please know that that's GMO. And also the tremendous devastation that happens on cane sugar orchards and, and how that I really encourage you all to go on YouTube and, and get some education on how that's harvested and the incredible slave labor to bring uh, sugar to our tables. So this is a way that we can be completely off grid is growing our own yacon and it's, an, it's a polysaccharide whereas a, other sugars that you eat is a monosaccharide. So it's feeding the type of organisms that are beneficial that you want breaking down your fermentation. It's a more intelligent way, um, we believe, for our own teas to break down and really spark that, that nutrient-rich quality. So here's um, some of our teas. This is some skunk cabbage. Skunk cabbage has incredible terpenes. If anybody knows it, it's the one that really smells more like weed than anything else. We love to get skunk cabbage um, because of its high terpenes, and it makes a beautiful ferment. And if we couple it with a little bit of yacon syrup that we had um, used, you know, uh, had made over the winter, it breaks down really quickly. And what you're seeing up there in the right-hand corner is a bag of soil that that 
skunk cabbage came from. So not only are we gathering the skunk cabbage, but we're just going to grab a little handful of soil because skunk cabbage really breaks down fast in its own soil. So we're bringing an IMO into this tea by just bringing a handful of the dirt that is growing. So every time we collect any type of plant material, we're always grabbing a little bit of dirt because we know that dirt has the highest intelligence to break down the material that we're gathering. Um, um, here's how we just roll all of our ferments out. Um, up on the tea house, we're just chopping this cannabis. These are all the males. Uh, we grow a lot of flowers, they have high terpenes, and they ferment uh, with, in, this is a little bit of EM that we make on our own property. That was something from a while ago, um, something that was stored. Uh, nettles. And usually in a hot summer, it will probably take about five days until the fermentation is ready. And then we put it into another barrel and aerate it. Um, and if it's a cooler, you know, maybe in the fall or in the spring, it's going to take about a whole week to 10 days. So sort of the warmer the climate, the faster your ferments are, are going to go. So after the plants sit after you know five to seven days you start to get the bubbles and the bubbles are the uh, the fermentation and you know you can put a uh like a paddle we have paddles that we use and we put them in there and it just bubbles up and you can just know it's it's super crazy and alive and really beautiful um there's also blending nettles and doing that for for tea um, but this is i'm going to show you our teas right here so essentially what we do is we have the stump down at the bottom here. And you know we might chop it up on the stump, maybe we chop it on the tail, we put all the weeds in here, we put the culture in there, and we, bubble, and we uh, let it ferment anaerobically. So we let it anaerobically with the dirt and then get broken down. And then we take a bucket and we pour it through a strainer. And that's what's on the left over there is just a simple metal mesh, like a quarter inch wire mesh. And there's our paddles. Those work really good for hash making too because they're brewer's paddles and they have the holes in them and they're really awesome. So you can see the wire mesh there. I, I started activating this this uh, this right here a little bit with air. So what, But what, what I'm doing is taking the water out from here, putting it through there, straining it because I'm going to gravity feed it and I don't want too much material in there. But then we take this air hose and we activate it overnight. So basically we're saying we got this beautiful growth hormone, rich, really beautiful um, hormones, and then we put it in there and we bubble it overnight and that activates it. And it's a really beautiful thing, and that charges it up, oxygenates it. Then those oxygenated um, organisms can eat the anaerobic organisms, and really you just created a bunch of food for this oxygenated life. And um, when you have a lot of carbon in your soil, or maybe you, maybe you overdid it with carbon a little bit, these weed teas can really help balance it out and give you a lot of uh, green, available green nutrients right away. So now we're just gonna get, you know, we're showing, these are our flower strip, and the, with the, those are the flowers that we, ha that we have here for you, and they bloom all summer. And um, we just really love the zinnias because there's so many different kinds of flavors. That There's a bee hotel right there with borage growing all around it, and you're gonna get to see how the gardens develop. You know, you're gonna see how we started them and how they develop and how they thrive and how everything's growing on each other. And we're going to get to a point of the living willow here in a second. But is there any questions that anyone has at this moment right here? As much as you can get, the cool thing about fermenting in the year is that in the springtime, if you want to ferment, you're going to ferment a bunch of really small, living, brand new, straight life hormones. But as you start getting towards the end of the year, you're growing all these sunflowers, all these things, and you start to get flowers that have created seeds, and that has more phosphorus in it because every plant is trying to get potassium, phosphorus, and manganese, and iron up into its thing. So when you take those flowers and those seeds and those leaves and you chop them up, then you're getting more of those ending 
uh, phase nutrients that you need. So maybe you get into chopping up some leaves and some sticks towards the end too, you know, or the roots. The roots have a lot of potassium, so also plants are creating roots, and by the end of the summer you can chop up roots. Question? Yeah, well, it's a lactic acid bacteria culture that, you know, effect of microorganisms is a, a term that comes from Japan, and then lactic acid bacteria kind of came up from the Korean natural farming. And um, also in Hawaii, before all of the natural farming got there, there was a thing called B BAM, um, which is the beneficial act of microorganisms. And if anyone hung out in Hawaii, like in the late 90s or in the early, like in Kauai especially, there was some really awesome family that were creating culture there. So super quick, um, we just took our uh, neighbor's cow milk and uh, then we separated it. We used the serum. You can definitely go on to our Instagram account or our Facebook account, which we're not active on, but there's some really good exactly how we do it. Um, and then there's the separated of the serum and then it's fed the yakon molasses and then the ending part of that is the purple uh, uh, sulfur bacteria which you can find um, in like low-lying creeks and stuff and you want to find them in beautiful pond areas and you can learn how to identify it and that's what really makes it you know, to where it's not just a lab and LAB, but more of an EM. It's a little bit higher of an intelligent uh, microorganism, and we use that as like a starter and always keep it going. Just just like you would keep your sourdough starter going. You oh, you got to always be feeding it and adding it into your teas, so you know you're having really good ferments. Um, the purple sulf. The purple non-sulfur bacteria. Yeah, and anybody can hit us up for this information. This is going to be put out, this in, you know, information, and we're really available at any time. So any other questions? Yeah. What? Um, the question is, are fish and kelp ferments important? Um, you know, that's, that's sort of a deep question. For me, I, I feel like nothing's important unless I grow it on my farm. And I'm really, you know, that's a whole other big two to three hour conversation is all of the nutrient values of all the different cover crops and different biomass gardens that you can make. So we didn't even discuss the biomass gardens that you can grow so that all of your calcium is being taken care of, your nitrogen, your phosphorus. You know, you've got all of your minerals really taken care of. And rather than feeding your teas like a C90, SEA90 trace minerals, it's an amazing thing. It's the one thing that we do bring onto our property that we do buy. Because then we can add that C90 to our biomass gardens. Our biomass gardens are fully nutritive. They've got all of the minerals that you could possibly ever want. And then make those into a tea that our cannabis plants totally get. They understand how to uptake you know, uh, degraded and composted plant material. They get it. So rather than feeding that, the minerals that are in powder form, why not feed your powder form minerals to your biomass garden and then feed your biomass garden to your cannabis plants? And that's sort of the way that we roll. So, you know, kelp, if you can find it, awesome. That's great. Is it necessary? No. I think that I think that also Acadian kelp. A lot of people get it. You know, we're starting to realize that you go. You all have you know stringent heavy metal tests. There's there's a lot of heavy metal in a lot of kelp that could be definitely OMRI certified. And again, I want to remind you, OMRI certification is a registry. It is not an organic certification. So find out what it is that you're bringing onto your property because you could be bringing more problems than you're bringing help. And remember, every drop, you, you drop a stone and you really have to look at that stone is the amendment that you bring in and you got to look at the 30th ripple that it creates. 
not just the first ripple. Yeah, dude, that was awesome for my plant. It really got green. Well, what happened to the 30th ripple? And now all of a sudden you've got acidic soil because you were bringing in glyphosate material over a long period of time that killed your fungi in your, in your, in your beds. Any other questions? I have one more thing, maybe more than one. But this is... Oh, yeah something I want to talk about to the community. We're going to do a post about it too later in the spring, but we want to do the crystal ganja challenge. So it's going to be, this is just some Oregon accumulators at the base of, of a ganja tree. So that's one thing. But what we're saying is get a crystal, the biggest one you can. Maybe you have a clone greenhouse or something and you want to try like 20 different crystals, you know, and see which one does the best for your clone. But put your seed right on top of the crystal and grow your seed on the crystal. And then the roots will grab onto the crystal and get energy from that crystal. And it'd be a beautiful, if you plant your seed on the moon cycle, you know, on a cancer moon, you know, it's going to connect that cosmos and, and, and talk about the most effective seeds you know s start you can get if you do it over cosmic energies like like crystals it can be an amazing thing and you could also use like the japanese clay balls or whatever you need but what we're saying is like we should all plant some crystal underneath our ganja and then at the end of the year we can go to a, a gathering together and put all of our crystal staves together and see what they looked like We're just going to stop at the end of this talk and talk about the Pure Collective and the, and the certification that we've created. It's really important. What we do is, is one thing, and it's one we've done on our farm, but we've used that energy to create a certification. We did it for free initially, and it's still free for now because it's an activist. It's always going to be free. We're, we're, we're developing it now, and we're, we're trying to create more certifications, so we're going to have uh, a new development to our certification. But um, the farms and the families that are part of the pure certification are people that I would do anything for in this world. And I would do a lot for people that I don't know, too. But the people in this group are really, really important to me. I consider them total family members, and I really respect and love them 100%. Um, and the intentions that are going into these farms, the intentions that are coming out in the products um, are healing the world. And, and the, the stories that we have that are people changing, crossing over from terminal illness, and those are the things that really drive us forward. And yeah. And, and like I said earlier, we're using plant as a catalyst to save the world because we know that it all can save the world. That's why we're all sitting here and we're here for hours just going on and listening about our most favorite subject. I don't know if you guys know, but like you could start out a conversation about black beans and it ends in cannabis or like you start out like, you know, diaper conversation it ends in cannabis. It's really crazy. So I think that we can take this momentum that we have and we can really utilize cannabis as a catalyst to save the world. And, and people that are in the Dem Pure Collective right now are amazing people that are in the cannabis industry. And everybody can be a part of it. And the reason why it's free is because you can't pay to play. It means that you have to have a regenerative garden that matters. And if you are a consumer, please look for that Dem Pure seal. That means that these people have six closed loops and way beyond. They are leading the education here. And can you be a part of it? Absolutely. Anybody can be a part of it. We are going worldwide. Okay, so what it takes really quickly, Josh said, is six closed loops. You have to grow food. You have to grow a medicine garden. If you're a food gardener, you have to grow a little bit of medicine. If you're a medicine gardener, you have to grow a little bit of food. You have to be conscious. You have to be a righteous, cannabis-loving person. And you have to want to be an educator out in our community. And I'm pretty sure that pretty much describes a shit ton of people here in this room. So, you know, we're worried about this corporate takeover with cannabis right now. Why are we worried? Um, if we took all of the assets in this room and how much everybody here already yields, we're above and beyond any corporate cannabis being in this whole entire industry by quadruple, a thousandfold.
So joining together as a collective and realizing, you know, with like-minded people, let's really take this and let's go out into the world and, and let's know that this is a seed of change because God knows the world needs change. And we all know that this cannabis plant is going to do it for us. Thank you all so much and for being with us for all these hours. No, we're and I don't know if we have time. Daniel, do you want to say a poem? Do you have a poem for us, Daniel? Can, you, can we end this with a, a poem from Heart Rock? Daniel is an amazing person. We're going to invite him up here to say a poem for everyone to close it out. And I also want to say really quickly, give thanks to our family over here, the, the deaf family coming down from Southern Oregon. We're, we're working on creating new language with ourselves, with our own words, but these, these, family, these family over here is creating new words in sign language. They don't have words for this. This is groundbreaking and really amazing, and we really feel like that f the future is connecting human beings. We're all getting taken over by big business everywhere, and it's not okay, and it's not funny. So we're going to try and bring people together, and we're going to be awesome and we're going to be different and we're not going to be in opposition to everyone we're just going to show them our way and that's going to be good enough give thanks yeah so i'm a farmer and a poet and i love to see that symbolism cross over and uh you know this is just the beginning and, and but it really goes on forever you know and and the deeper you go you might think that you're you're full or that your heart is full, but like it swells like a seed and it cracks and it sprouts, you know? So this is called Tree of Love. My heart is full. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My heart is full, but this is just the beginning. For love has sprouted and will grow forever. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions from anyone? Let's um, smoke weed. <laughs> we'll be around all weekend. We're totally available. You know, we, we would love to talk more. We have seeds and... Um, next time we'll be biomass gardens. Let's go down that deep, deep one. Biomass gardens next. And, and, and also endophytes. Everybody's got to start looking at endophytes. We talk about the microbiome as like the soil, but what about the microbiome inside the plant? Yo, let's talk about that next time too. Thank you all so much. <laughs>